All righty. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to welcome our guest this week, Kevin T. Carter, the founder and chief investment officer of EMQQ. Kevin has a storied history of success throughout the investing world and has established himself as a key player in the China and emerging market spaces. As always, for those of you out in the audience, say hi to us in the chat. Let us know where you're viewing from. We love seeing those international audience members out there. Uh, and do please post those questions and comments throughout the presentation. Uh, and we'll jump into those once we get to the end of things here today. Without anything further from me, I'll go ahead, hand things over to Kevin, and we can jump into things today. Okay, great. And thank you all for uh, tuning in. So I'm going to do uh, three things. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, how I got involved with investing, how I think about investing. I'll then uh, tell you uh, what I have learned about emerging markets and China in the 16 years I've been focused on it, uh, on that part of investing. And then I'll, I'll hope to convince you that there's a fantastic long-term growth opportunity that's uh, happening uh, in the emerging and frontier markets, and that any and all young investors, investors in their 20s, 30s, 40s, anybody with a 10, 15, 20-year time horizon really ought to pay attention to what's happening with the internet in the rest of the world. Um, so uh, with that, um, I uh, started my career here in San Francisco uh, 28 years ago, and I've lived here in the Bay Area my whole life. I graduated from college in December of 1991, and I had one interview at a company called Roberts and Stevens and Company, which uh, when I got out of college was the leading uh, technology-focused investment bank. Uh, we used to call it the Goldman Sachs of San Francisco, but I think a lot of younger people now think of Goldman Sachs in not so positive terms. So uh, uh, either way, it was the leader in technology investment banking. And my interview lasted about 30 minutes. We talked about college basketball for 25 minutes, and then I got a brief overview of the investment business. And then I was told I could start Monday. And I said, well, how could I possibly start Monday? I don't know anything. And the guy said, go buy this book and read it over the weekend. And he got out a piece of paper and he wrote down a random walk down Wall Street. Now, some of you may be familiar with this book. I highly recommend any of you uh, that are uh, investing actively, uh, you ought to read this book. It was first published in 1972 when I was three years old. And in the first edition, the author, Bert Malkiel, suggested that somebody should make an index fund because back then there were no index funds. And Burton was one of many uh, or a few uh, early uh, advocates to, to make a low cost index fund because before that, at the end of the year, people would say, well, the manage active managers didn't beat the index. And then people would say, you can't buy the index. And so it, this first edition of this book suggested, why not, let's do it. And a couple of years later, John Bogle, his friend, created the first uh, 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 Vanguard S&P index fund. And so this book and its author are long associated with indexing, with a uh, emerging markets, and with ETFs. The author, Bert uh, Malkiel, is a Princeton economist, but he was also the chairman of the committee that created the first ETF, the Spider. So that's how I started my career, reading about indexing, but I very quickly gravitated towards Omaha. And I try to think about every business and investment decision through an Omaha lens first and foremost. But about 22 years ago, I got mixed up with this guy and started working with him. And so I've had one foot in the active world, one foot in the indexing world, for 22 years. And the first thing we did, which was uh, called e-investing, was we launched uh, what was the first fractional share brokerage. I uh, filed a patent on fractional share brokerage in 1999, and we formed a company that we sold to E-Trade in the year 2000. We then uh, turned our attention to uh, what's now be called, become known as direct indexing building your own personalized S&P 500 portfolio that would allow you to uh, both 
beat the index on an after-tax basis, but also customize your portfolio. And if you didn't want to own tobacco stocks, you could leave those out or what have you. And so we sold that company. Uh, they call that direct indexing now. It's still our, our version. Active Index Advisors is still operating. It was acquired by Natixis Asset Management at the end of um, 2005, uh, or rather the end of 2004. And a few months before that, Google had gone public, however. And when Google went public, they asked my partner, Burton, to give a talk to their employees about investing. And so Burton was on the West Coast and I had dinner with him the night before and I didn't, I wasn't invited to the Google talk, but he went down and gave a talk to the employees of Google about investing since they were about to have some money. And a couple of months later, a guy from Google Googled me and called me and said, hey, I want to invest with you. And I said, well, who's your advisor? And he said, well, I don't have an advisor. And I said, well, we don't work with individuals, we work with advisors and Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank. So you'd have to work with, with someone there. And he was very insistent that he didn't want to do that. And uh, one thing led to another and I basically became his investment advisor. And then he introduced me to a handful of his other Google engineer friends. And next thing you know, I'm going back and forth to Mountain View every week in early uh, 2005 and much of 2005. And meanwhile, my partner Burton has taken a great interest in China. A couple of his Princeton colleagues had returned to teach economics in Beijing and they convinced him to come and see what was happening. He ended up writing a white paper about investing in China and the people at Google found out about it and called me and said, can Burton come down and talk about investing in China? And I said, okay, sure. Next time he's uh, in San Francisco, we can do that. And it was 15 years ago that Burton and I drove from San Francisco down to Mountain View and Burton gave his talk. And then all these people looked at me and said, we want to invest in China. And I, at that point, I had never been to China and I didn't really know anything about China other than what I had uh, picked up in my education or read in Bert's paper. But uh, from the moment that talk ended until today, my entire professional life has revolved around trying to figure out what on earth does that even mean to invest in China and how should you go about doing it? So with that lengthy intro, let me tell you what I've learned about emerging markets and, and why I think you ought to be interested in uh, emerging markets uh, version 3.0. So uh, when it comes to investing in emerging markets, the, the first thing to, to, to do is ask, what exactly are they? And so to, to look at it on a map, in terms of the population size and in terms of the e economy, the GDP sizing, and in terms of the stock market size, it's about 60% Asia, with China being the biggest part. It's about 20% Mexico and the rest of Central and South America. And then approximately 10% is Africa and 10% Eastern Europe with Russia and Turkey being uh, the main part. So, and then beyond emerging markets, you have the so-called frontier markets, which are, uh, call it the farm team for emerging markets. And we at EMQQ include all of these countries as part of our universe. And this is important. These are, uh, these are the countries where the people are. 85% of the world's people are in emerging markets. Even more of the future as measured by young people, almost 90% of people under the age of 30 are in emerging and frontier markets and their economies have been growing faster. Their GDPs as the left side of the slide shows are now bigger. But if you look at the right side of the slide, you'll see the emerging market share of a number of categories, three of which I've called out with a red arrow. The top one is showing you again that this is where all the people are, but the bottom two red arrows are showing you that in the consumption categories, retail sales, consumer spending, emerging markets are way behind. And it's the closing of that gap that is the story. The thing that is emerging are the people. Billions of people, they're moving on up and they want stuff. They want more and better food, 
more and better clothing. They want appliances. They want entertainment and vacations. They want cars and they want their children to go to Harvard. And that's the story. I didn't have to figure it out. It was pretty well documented when I showed up. And you can see McKinsey and Company at the bottom of this slide calls it not just a big opportunity, but in their words, the biggest growth opportunity ever. So even if they're wrong and it's the second or third biggest, it's a big deal and it's what everybody should be focused on. Now, unfortunately, and this is very important, the traditional ways of measuring emerging markets, the indexes themselves that the ETFs track, these are not the way to invest in emerging markets. And the reason is they don't give you the exposure uh, that you'd like in the uh, growth part of emerging markets. The indexes are full of government-owned banks, government-owned oil companies, and these companies are inefficient, they're corrupt, and you really need to avoid them. And unfortunately, the way the investment world evolved when, the, when they set up the emerging markets uh, category, when they basically rebranded third world countries as emerging markets, uh, the only companies they could find to invest in were the government-owned banks and oil companies. And again, these are not real companies. And that's why people look at the broad index. They look at their Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF or their iShares Emerging Markets ETF, and they see that for the last 15 years, the return is zero. And I'm not optimistic that all of a sudden that broad way of investing in emerging markets uh, is going to really give investors the growth that they could get if they get a little more precise. And what they ought to do is get precise and capture what I think is not just the fastest growing sector in the world today, but what is, I believe, the fastest growing sector in the world ever. And I will offer you a $100,000 reward if you can prove me wrong. So here's what is happening. As I mentioned, um, it's all about the consumer. And I concluded after six or seven years that investors should just buy the emerging market consumer stocks. That's the story. That is what McKinsey calls the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. But, and, and so what I would tell people to do is buy the emerging market consumer ETF. It's an ETF that exists. I didn't have anything to do with it, but if you just wanted to buy the consumer stocks, uh, that was the ticker. It owned the 30 largest tr traditional consumer companies. But I had a friend call me about eight years ago, and she asked me what was the best emerging markets ETF for her three-year-old daughter's college fund. So if I've got 15 years, what should I invest in? And I started to tell her what I told everybody, which was to just buy the emerging market consumer. But then I had a light bulb moment, because what I realized was that consumption was changing. And so if you the really bake EMQQ down into its components. It's three things happening at the same time. And we call it the great confluence, but it's a mashup of three mega trends, three big things that are happening. And it's, they're happening here, but we were the first people involved. And so we forget that everybody doesn't have all of the things that we have and take for granted, including a second pair of shoes, a vacation planned for the holidays, a car. So the first mega trend we've been part of for a couple of generations, at least, maybe three in my family. But the reality is most of the world's just now getting enough extra money to buy a dishwasher or take a vacation. So that's the first mega trend. Now, the second mega trend is something that I've been part of for 30 years. And but it took an interesting turn 10 years ago, about the time that I got that call from my friend. When I got that call, I answered it on my iPhone, which was sitting on my car seat when she called me. So I had a smartphone back then, but it was pretty new. I only had it for a couple of years. 
And I could already see how it was changing my family's consumption. The trips to the Target store were going down and the UPS truck was coming every day all of a sudden. And if you think about how this device changed us and you map it over to the emerging markets, well, then the story gets really big. Because again, I had a computer for 20 years before I got a smartphone. The reality is all of those billions of new consumers, they've never had a computer before. And they never are going to have one if you're thinking about the one on your desk. So all of the, and, it, and most of these uh, smartphones, uh, they don't have an Apple logo because we're talking $60, $80 brand new smartphones made in China, running on Android, getting better every year and more affordable every year. So all of these people are getting their first computer and it comes with something else that we take for granted. Something I've had for 25 years called the internet, which I first got on a telephone line with a modem in the Marina District of San Francisco in 1995. Now the internet just shows up in my pocket. Well, most of the world never had telephone lines, let alone high-speed cable. So you're giving these billions of people their first computer, their first internet connection, and very importantly, because the infrastructure for consumption, the consumption infrastructure, if you will, is by definition undeveloped. And when I say consumption infrastructure, I'm talking about bank accounts with a debit card in everybody's pocket. That doesn't exist. Cable TVs on the wall with a thousand channels. That doesn't exist. Target stores, even if you had a car to drive to, don't exist. And so these people are leapfrogging traditional consumption. And here's the result. This is where the $100,000 bet comes into play. This is showing you the revenue growth for the EMQQ sector, the emerging markets internet sector, going back to 2009. And you can see that's an average annual growth rate of almost 38% a year. Now, that's not easy to do for any single company, let alone an entire sector. And so I'm not 100% sure of anything in the investment world, but I've offered uh, I've given this presentation to hundreds of professional investor groups, dozens of CFA societies, and I've offered my reward. I've asked everybody I know who's smarter and older than me if they can think of a sector that ever did this, and so far my inbox is empty. So that is the result. Fast growth, and what comes with that? Value creation. So you can see how the uh, Emerging Markets Internet Index has done in, over that period in blue. Now it's in the middle of a significant sell-off, which I will describe for you and suggest you take advantage of. Uh, but still, even after that big decline, very good returns over this time frame. Meanwhile, bouncing along the bottom in yellow, the broad index, which it has a 51% return over this period. But if we made the chart two years longer, you return is zero. So, so value creation, fundamental growth, value creation. Now, Alibaba and Tencent are the two biggest of these companies uh, under a lot of pressure in the last uh, few months. And uh, I'm confident they'll uh, do just fine. But these two companies are best not thought of as technology companies. Uh, these are really consumer companies. And this is the real problem. The internet companies are called technology companies and internet companies are becoming the consumer companies. And and they're just, what they're doing is they're digitizing consumption in a smartphone centric world. And Alibaba and Tencent are true super apps. They're in healthcare, um, they're in uh, entertainment, they're in food and groceries. This is Alibaba's grocery store. This is the closest I've ever been to the Jetsons. And they're in the money and banking and financial services. And the FinTech story in the developing world is on fire. And it's quite a paradox. You would think me, a fintech entrepreneur in San Francisco, you would think I would be on the cutting edge of this mobile money thing, but it's not me. It's the developing and, and, and fr frontier markets uh, that are the most advanced in mobile payments. And, and once you get the money on the phone, you can get into all sorts of other financial services. You can provide investment products. Alibaba has a wealth management group in China with Vanguard as their partner. You can get into insurance products and you can get into banking and lending. And it's the banking and lending part 
that got Alibaba's fintech group uh, ant in a little bit of trouble, but uh, maybe we'll come to that. And then of course, beyond Alibaba and Tencent, there are several other uh, Chinese uh, e-commerce and internet companies of some size, Baidu, Pinduoduo, JD, Meituan. So now, but let's talk about what's going on beyond China because the emerging markets, China is the biggest part by far, but there's a lot going on elsewhere. And just to put it in perspective, you know, China might be an emerging market for the broad indexes, but in terms of e-commerce, you'd have to say it's the most developed country in the world. China's e-commerce market is four times as big as the other 45 emerging and frontier markets combined. So it is uh, the biggest by far. But what's happening outside of China is actually getting pretty interesting. And we own uh, all emerging markets internet companies, and you can see the non-China ones. Uh, this chart is showing you that revenue again with the China revenue in blue, the non-China revenue in gold, and the non-China, the India, the Brazil, the Russia, those companies are now reaching $100 billion in annual sales, which is where China was when we launched seven years ago. And the IPOs coming from non-China internet companies is really accelerated. You can see uh, there's now 60 non-China internet uh, companies in the developing world that are publicly traded. In fact, that number is closer to 70 now uh, because we haven't updated the chart in a month, but there is a flurry of activity. Now we've had some of these non-China companies for a long time. Mercado Libre, one of the companies that inspired EMQQ, this is the Amazon and the PayPal of Brazil and Mexico and all of Central and South America. You won't find this company in your Vanguard or iShares fund, the traditional indexes for some reason, which I've stopped trying to identify, they, they miss a lot of these companies. I think a lot of it has to do with their trading in the United States. Mercado Libre, one of those. C Limited, this is one of the best performing stocks in the world over the last few years. Trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Headquarters in Singapore, but don't let the fact sheet fool you. That revenue is coming from all over Southeast Asia. And it's a, a company that doesn't have a US equivalent. This is a company that's in gaming, they're in e-commerce and they're in FinTech. Uh, and again, a bit of very strong performing stock. It's been neck and neck with Tesla, I think, for the last four years. Eastern Europe's Google is Yandex, which is also uh, Eastern Europe's Uber, having beat Uber in Russia. Uber now a minority stakeholder. Africa's Jumia trades on the New York Stock Exchange. This company's out of Nigeria. Very, very volatile stock, but Africa's got a great long-term uh, opportunity set. And in the fourth quarter of last year, the, the geographic spread of these things just took off. We had Poland's e-commerce leader go public. We have this fascinating company out of Uruguay go public on the NASDAQ, D-Local. This is a fintech operation that, that is doing business in dozens of emerging and frontier markets. Uruguay is how it shows up on the fact sheet. And it's profitable and growing at 100%, one of my favorite businesses. Valuation's a little rich, it's come down though. Uh, Turkey's e-commerce leader. This company came public at 14, is now trading at two. Turkey's had some, uh, currency headwinds, but anytime I see an IPO break that bad, I uh, get involved with a, a small rooting interest as I did last week. And uh, so this is a, the Turkish e-commerce leader founded by a woman came public over the summer. Right after that, Indonesia's e-commerce leader came public in Indonesia. We've got a publicly traded Kazakhstan company trading in London, Kospi. And India is now where the most action is. Zomato, the, the DoorDash of India, went public in, uh, over the summer. Paytm, the uh, Indian fintech leader that's backed by both Ant Group and Berkshire Hathaway came public uh, uh, last week. Uh, the deal, I think, broke a little bit, but the long-term picture for India is great. And finally, a week ago, we had Brazil's new bank, the largest online bank in the world, it went public on the New York Stock Exchange. Tencent owns a piece of this company, and I like to feature it because my heroes in Omaha are also uh, an investor. So, so this story is spreading, and it's got a long way to go. 
And beyond just the investment opportunities, the social elements to the story are amazing. To see how these people's lives are changing so dramatically overnight, things that we've had for generations, things that we've evolved um, along the way with, these people are getting overnight. That smartphone becomes everything, their first computer, their first communication, their first map, their first flashlight, their first calculator, their first TV, everything. It is a magic device to them and that's how they refer to it. And uh, it's still pretty early. So in summary, the emerging markets internet sector is uh, where the growth is. And uh, I believe it's unprecedented growth and it's explained by these three mega trends happening at the same time, a mashup of big long-term secular trends. Everybody else in the world wants more and better food, clothing, et cetera. They're getting a computer, it's in their pocket and it's got the internet, but there's no wire. And, uh, and because of a lack of traditional consumption infrastructure, primarily no bank accounts, they're leapfrogging. And that explains this incredible growth rate. Side benefit in a part of the world where corruption and malfeasance is your biggest problem, you actually get very good corporate governance in these companies because most of them have been funded when they're starting out, they're getting funded by Harvard and Stanford through a US venture fund, which is why they've traded on our exchanges. So you can count on better governance, I think, uh, in this group. And you also get exposure to the frontier markets and a lot of markets that aren't even categorized as emerging or frontier yet because they're that far uh, behind. So now we've had a crisis in China. I, I won't go into this in any detail, but let me just tell you as someone that's dealt with China and investing in China for 16 years, there is so much negativity now and so much noise and I don't see the cause. I mean, I see the why, the, I see the cause, but I don't think the fundamental story has changed. And I think this is a classic Mr. Market if you're familiar with Ben Graham and Warren Buffett's Mr. Market, uh, Mr. Market's lost his mind, I think. And I understand it because everybody's afraid of China. No one's ever been there. I talk to investors all the time and fear of China is the first thing I learned about 16 years ago. And it's, it's persistent and it's always there. And everybody's convinced the Chinese government is going to steal their money. They don't know how or why. But as soon as they get involved, people get scared. And unfortunately, the Chinese government has to regulate just as our government does. And in doing so in July, they upset the apple cart a little bit. And uh, people's worst fear about the Chinese government stealing their money kind of happened. There's an, some important asterisks on that China education crackdown. But Either way, it was shoot first and ask questions later. People were already worried about China and their worst fear happened, at least if you owned the online education companies. We did not own them, so uh, it didn't hurt us at all. But uh, the market reaction was severe and uh, incredibly uh, negative. And I took great comfort because, again, you know, I didn't see the, the reason for so much panic. The fundamentals, if I separate, the fundamentals, the businesses grew at over 30% this year. They'll do the same, about the same next year and are profitable. And we're regulating our co companies too. And it's on the front page of the New York Times and the FANG stocks are making new highs. So I'm with Ray Dalio. China's smart. They know what they're doing. Capitalism has worked there. And I don't believe they're going to go away from it and private enterprise because they know it works and they've benefited the most. And when I was young, they told me to buy fear and it is here right now. So we're still the best performing emerging markets approach over the seven years since we launched by a decent amount, even after the recent wipeout. And I'm confident we will be number one again in the future, but we might be number two because there's one other thing that we've got that is uh, 
now available uh, through a, a product that tracks another index, which is what we call the next frontier, Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce Index or FMQQ. And it's uh, the same story X china So if you don't want China for any reason, uh, maybe you own KWeb or CQQQ or, or otherwise don't need China, you can now buy the beyond China part. And this is a pretty exciting group of companies and countries. I talked about it earlier, but let me just point out what makes this uh, so uh, exciting. So again, these are all of the companies that are part of the EMQQ index that aren't China, now have their own index. And these companies, uh, uh, as mentioned, there's a lot of them coming. And you can see that on the right side of this slide, what, what this slide is showing you is that same revenue I showed you earlier, but the China revenues in gold and the beyond China revenues in purple. And you can see on the far right, the, the, the other countries, the other 45 countries, their revenue is now passing 100 billion, which is where the China internet companies were when we launched seven years ago. And there's four times as many people in the purple. So that purple has got four times as many people as the gold. And if you look at the left side of this slide, you can see China's e-commerce market is 25% of retail sales. And you can see that the FMQQ uh, countries have an average of less than 5%. Uh, so you've got four times the people, one-fifth the penetration. So when I look at that, those two charts and I look at that revenue right there, I feel pretty confident that purple revenue is going to 200 billion. And I'll bet you it's going to go to 500 billion. And I'll even bet you it's going to go to 10 hundred billion. I don't know how long it'll take, but I've still never met anybody that used to have a smartphone. So uh, I think this also is a very good way for long term investors to get exposure uh, to these three secular megatrends. And um, valuations seem very reasonable. Now, I. Uh, am a value investor, but the PE does not mean anything to me without the G. I'm buying the future earnings. And so uh, I'll, I'll pay a 10 PE for one thing and I'll pay a 50 PE for something else. And if you've got a revenue growth rate uh, that supports it. And so what I look for are pegs that are low and a peg under one and a half, uh, I think is low and a peg under one, at least what Peter Lynch taught me in his books is that's that's where you really want to be hunting. And right now, the pegs are very reasonable. And they're half the, the valuations of the, uh, of the U.S. Uh, internet companies. And the, the U.S. S&P 500, the, the broad market, that peg ratio may be actually closer to three and a half because the revenue growth for this year is going to come off significantly. Our revenue and really all of these revenue numbers will be lower in 2022 but the S&P revenue growth rate normalized about 5%. So that's a peg of, call it three and a half. So either way, I don't make short-term stock market predictions, but uh, uh, I feel very confident that three, five, seven years from now, uh, these two groups of businesses will do very well. So that uh, is uh, the conclusion of my presentation, and I'm happy to do uh, as much Q&A as you'd like. All right. Well, definitely uh, some interesting thoughts there, to say the least. Uh, I can almost hear the uh, the gears turning in all of our uh, viewers' heads right now as they contemplate all of these ideas that seem almost, uh, I won't say controversial, but contrasting to a lot of uh, what our media has displayed lately uh, around the investment world and, and jumping into some of these different markets. Would you call... I guess U.S. media and its perception of some of these other uh, companies, just to, to put a personal curiosity out there, a, a headwind to these companies, or are they largely unaffected by what we think of them? Well, it's a headwind to the stocks, for sure. And and there are some headwinds to the companies fundamentally, but, but really, I mean, we're, we're, the main thing we're talking about here is a, a, a complete disintegration of sentiment around the Chinese internet companies in particular. 
And, and again, it's, it's the most persistent thing that, you know, for 16 years, it's, it's something I've, I've experienced is that people just, it's a foreign country, it's communist, and we just don't trust them. And, and, and I understand that because that's, I mean, when I got involved, I didn't know much about China, but what I've realized is that the, the, the adjectives and adverbs that are used in any reporting on China, whether it's about the government or the Olympics or, or the companies, you know, it, it's always got a, a, a spin of negativity and suspicion. And I think most of it's unfounded. And, and um, so, you know, there's no doubt that, that, that some of these companies are, are, you know, regulations are coming for them as they are here. I mean, and it's not a bad thing necessarily, right? And and it's on the front page of the paper. It's in 60 minutes. I mean, the FANG stocks are, are under attack by our government, by the European government. They're paying billions of dollars in fines every month, it seems like. And so the so really what China's government is doing is trying to get their arms around these giant platform companies. You have to remember that the FANG stocks and the, the stocks that are you know, part of EMQQ, some of them have grown at these incredible rates. And if you grow 40, 50% for five, six, seven years, you become, no matter what size you are when you started, you become very, very large and powerful and important. <clears throat> and, and, and the nature of these things is also somewhat disruptive. And so Existing regulations, if you had them, may be outstripped by the, the developments around the internet and the smartphone world. And, and so our governments are trying to catch up. The only difference is in our system, there's a lot of money involved. And you've got lobbyists and special interest groups. And the companies themselves are spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to convince us that, hey, we should trust them. And and I don't know what you know the details of all the back and forth. I just know that that the Chinese system isn't like that. The Chinese system, they've got a lot of smart people running their economy. A lot of them went to our best colleges. Some of them taught at our best colleges and they've studied our systems. They've studied the European systems, and they're trying to do what they think is best for their country and to ensure that risks are mitigated and 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 competition is fair and and the only difference is that they don't have to, you know, they, they can be decisive. And unfortunately, that scares people. And they think, oh, my gosh, they, uh, they're, they're changing the fintech rules because they're mad at Jack Ma and Jack Ma's missing. And I mean, it's, just, it's, it's just a bunch of noise, right? I mean, it, if you don't think the Chinese government believes in capitalism anymore and and you think that they don't want uh, private enterprise and people to make profits, then you, you don't want to invest in China for sure. But they haven't issued any statements saying that they're going to steal all your money. They've said Didi is not in compliance with their cybersecurity law. Didi is not in compliance with their cybersecurity law. Um, so the in the delisting part of the story, that's the part that there's just if you dig into the delisting risk, that's the most intellectually dishonest thing on so many different levels. And if you really understand that, I'm happy to go into it, but it, it should give you more questions about our government and processes than the veracity of Chinese accounting. Well, fair enough there. And I, I think that's a, a great explanation, kind of covering the overarching uh, situation that we've seen here over the last couple of months in most of our popular media. Turning over to some of these questions rolling in from our audience, and it seems as we continue to talk here, we have more showing up, which is always a, a good sign. Uh, the Jewish man, one of our, our regular viewers here coming in, um, and he wanted to, to poke at you for a bit to ask your thoughts on the Hang Seng uh, Index, as seems to be selling under book value and uh, it's according to him. The last time they were, it was so cheap. We were in the dot com bubble, and he was hoping to get some of your thoughts there. Okay, well, 
I'll have to admit to you, I'm not very current on the actual Hang Seng Index. I mean, obviously, that's a, the old uh, standard for Hong Kong, and I guess was in some ways the standard for China before the before the FTSE Xinhua uh, iShares Fund came out. But um, uh, look, the Chinese tech companies are under assault. They're under assault from our government. They're under assault from their own government. And and that's why, you know, with the, the I'm going to say, I without even looking at it, I'm going to say it probably is a pound the table buy because I know the sentiment is so bad. And, and you know, that's it, very important in investing. I mean, you got to separate two things. You've got the businesses and the fundamentals, which is ultimately all you should care about, right? You're buying a business and what gives it value is its earnings. And what's ma- what makes its value go up is the growth of earnings, full stop. And so that's the businessman hat. And then you say, okay, well, how much does the business cost versus those earnings now and the future earnings? And when everyone's excited about the future and thinks it's you know nothing but up, well, that's when people pay very high prices. And when you know, as we say in Omaha, you pay a high price for a cheery consensus. Well, the opposite, the converse of that must also be true. You're going to get your best buys when there's blood in the streets or what, you know, whatever your euphemism. And and I know, I think that the EMQQ index made a, a, a new low again today. So I don't, you know, no telling how, when the sentiment will turn around, but I mean, it really, you can't say it any more simply. They, they told me to buy fear. And every time I've done that in the past, it's worked. And I'm pretty sure it's going to work again. Definitely. And and on that note, uh, same viewer continued on uh, putting a, a specific name out there that we are all very well familiar with being Alibaba. Um, and, you know, obviously there's been a, a lot of headlines about it getting, you know, just beaten down recently. And just looking at the fundamentals, it seems to be a, a very cheap stock for what you're getting. Well, um, I bought some Alibaba. I think it was the last stock I bought in 2020. They were now the the Chinese internet companies are all under pressure. Alibaba has been under pressure since November of last year, though, because of the Ant Group situation. And so, uh, I bought some at uh, under two hundred dollars a share, which seemed incredibly cheap to me then. Now I know it's gone lower. I haven't sold mine, um, and I haven't really looked at it. I, I know that Charlie Munger has been buying. I'm sure he'll do more research, the uh, current research than me um, right now on it, but. It, everything about it looks it looks incredibly cheap and, and and this is one of the you know greatest businesses on the planet i mean it's under attack you know by by multiple fronts um but it, and it it it's certain to have you know slower growth in the future than it's had in the past i mean the law of large numbers uh, dictates that but i I think that Alibaba will be a three hundred dollars stock again one day, and um, and I think it looks really cheap. And I, you know, you net out the cash. The company's buying back stock, and it's it's. I feel pretty good pounding the table on Alibaba too. Definitely. And continuing on down our list, uh, Sarcher, and hopefully I'm saying that right for you out there. Uh, is bringing up a a, a topic that you hit on a bit there about a lack of transparency uh, in China and seemingly financial and and trust issues there. Would you classify this truly as that lack of transparency or or more of a a fear of things being different than how we do them here in the States? Uh, I think it's largely, well, it's a combination of things. It's it's, It's fear of things that are different. It's a Um, here's what I would say about the transparency issue. So there's all this skepticism, you know, for the longest time that people say, oh, they're making up the GDP numbers, right? That was, the, that was what I used to hear 16 years ago. I'm like, why would they do that, right? I mean, these are smart people. They're running a country. The, 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 again, the, the economic 
the economists running the country are very smart. They've gone to the best colleges in the world, ours. And they're not going to make up the GDP numbers. Now, they certainly had, going back to the Mao days, some misreporting of agricultural outputs, which led to a 30 million people dying famine. And so that lack of uh, accounting uh, credibility carried forward in their reputation. And, and then the other thing that has driven this fear of Chinese accounting is the U.S. penny stock promoters, because the, the biggest problem is that you have, and I, I thought this problem went away, but when the House or when the Senate passed the delisting bill a couple of years ago, back when the corona was just kind of coming to town, uh, I went through the list of all the Chinese companies that were part of this PCAOB delisting threat. And I was shocked to see that there were still 150 penny stocks. And these, are, these aren't China frauds, though. These are Long Island and Florida frauds. This is pump and dump city and Wolf of Wall Street. And they made a movie about this called The China Hustle. And, you know, and basically these were just penny stock schemes that they the fake company was purportedly going to capitalize on all this growth in China. And, and unfortunately it burned a lot of people to the point they made a, a, a documentary about it. But in, so if you look at the, the Chinese companies in the U S you've got those companies, which avoid at all costs. And some of them trade on the junior, junior fake NASDAQ, but you know, this is not the real NASDAQ. Then you've got the state owned enterprises, which are now leaving and you don't want to invest in them anyhow. And then you got you know 60 or 80 real Chinese companies, the internet companies for the most part. Um, and again, I, I think you can be comfortable with their most of their accounting because again, they've gone through pretty stringent fundraising from the beginning. I mean, the, the people that start these companies, they're Chinese people that came and went to Harvard and their friends went to work at Morgan Stanley and they went and started, you know, went to work for. Amazon and or Alibaba and started their own company. And so there, I think you can just think the internet companies are generally clean. Now you did have the luck and coffee scandal and, and that happened that that company was backed by institutional um, Asian investors. So uh, including the Singapore sovereign wealth fund. So, you know, some frauds do happen and that was a real company that got ahead of itself, but it scarred people. And so I, I do think you can trust the internet company's accounting. And again, the delisting, they've, let me tell you about the, the original delisting, okay? This is, I do think investors should understand this because this delisting threat is, is, it's intellectually gross to me, this whole thing. So here's, here's how this delisting threat started. In May of 2020, the Senate passed a bill 945 called the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. And, and when the, se the senator from Louisiana who sponsored the bill gave his talk after it passed, he said, I just want Chinese companies to play by the rules. And all the other companies play by the rules, but the Chinese companies don't play by the rules. And I said, okay, well, the obvious first question is, what rule are you talking about? And the second obvious question is, who is in charge of enforcing the rule? Because the way he's talking about it, it made it sound like Alibaba showed up in New York City and pushed their way through security and ran up in the podium and rang the bell. And I, I was like, what, what, is that, what do you mean? And so I dug in. <clears throat> so 20 years ago, when the most respected company in the United States, according to Fortune magazine, Enron, turned out to be a big accounting fraud. Our government passed Sarbanes-Oxley, which as part of that uh, included the establishment of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And so this is a government entity that's amongst its, well, it's, it's supposed to ensure that the company is trading on US exchanges, are uh, clean and and part of their toolkit is the ability to review the audit notes of any company that trades on a U.S. exchange. And it turned out there were three countries that didn't allow that. 
France, Belgium, and China. So Anheuser-Busch was actually on the list because for tax reasons, they're in Belgium now. So even the red, white, and blue is uh, in violation of this 20-year-old law. And, and so the rule, the law passed 20 years ago says that any company on a U.S. exchange has to be subject to potential review of their audits, the paperwork, the notes. And when, when they passed the law, the Chinese oil companies were already trading on the New York Stock Exchange. And the lobbyists went to Washington with their money. And we didn't enforce our own rule for 20 years, which makes me kind of wonder what's up with that. Well, then if you dig deeper, the PCAOB itself, this organization that was going to would have saved investors, you know, from luck in coffee. That, that there is no way in the world that organization would is ever uncover irregularities, in my opinion. And it's so dysfunctional that in July of this year, the entire board of directors and all of the executives were fired for the dysfunction which included a senior executive having an affair with a subordinate and another subordinate finding out and blackmailing him. And then the chairman of the organization, the guy running the show, Dunkey, he got mad at one of his colleagues during a meeting and threw a Coke can across the room at him. So this whole, all of this noise about delisting that's been just driving investors crazy for months. It's been even longer than months. It's just noise. And, and even if they go through and we delist them, it won't be for a couple of years. The Chinese have been trying and we're working in good faith to resolve this situation. But I think largely because we've continued to attack them and say, we're going to delist them. I think they're finally realizing that they should trade in Hong Kong. And we don't care where they trade. We'll own them in Hong Kong or anywhere else. It might be a challenge for U.S. investors that own some of these companies if they do delist. Even if they relist in Hong Kong, I think a lot of retail investors, either their brokerage firm doesn't allow them to custody in Hong Kong, or they just don't feel comfortable doing it. But we can convert our Alibaba shares to Hong Kong listed shares any day of the week, and it, it, you know it's seamless. So. And yeah, the delisting is noise. Definitely. And one of our, our regular viewers here, Eric, is uh, chiming in, echoing you on the mass amount of noise, manipulation, media coverage that has surrounded this topic over the last couple of months here. Continuing on our, our list of questions here, uh, working our way down the list, looks like Dale, one of our usual viewers, is chiming in, uh, saying they think their their portfolio might be a little overweight in China right now. But continuing from there, they want to chime in and uh, get your thoughts on Turkey, what you think's going on there with currency kind of getting beaten down over these last couple of days here. Well, I haven't looked at the details of Turkey's situation. I know that the president was pushing, he was not going along with his economic advisors, and it sounds like he should have listened to his advisors. Um, so, but I can't speak to exactly, you know, what, what the outlook is. I, I do know, and I, I mentioned it, um, we did get a, a Turkish internet IPO, Hepsa Barada, uh, which trades uh, HCPS on the NASDAQ. And I haven't looked at the company, but you know, they, they they went public at 14, currency things happened, and, and other things may have happened. And in my experience, usually any credible IPO, the institutional investors that, that participate, they're going to do their homework, usually more than I'm going to have time to do my homework. And if they're going to go in and, and buy you know, 30, 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars worth of these companies at, at, at X, and I can show up a few months later and buy it for 0.1 X or 0.2 X. The times I've done that, it's worked out in my favor. Um, so, so I, again, that's, that's a very un uh, Omaha analysis, but I, the, the last time, well, anyhow, I, I, I 
I can't speak to Turkey specifically, but I do think hemp is probably something that you can make some money on um, if you buy and hold. For sure. Well, there you go, Dale. There's uh, the the short skinny of uh, of Turkey. Uh, looking down, we got another one of our regular viewers, WK, chiming in. Uh, with an interesting question here, uh, asking, in your opinion, if you could uh, call out a, a specific name here or, or your best guess or whatever you want to call it here, uh, but looking at this kind of overall storm around China and, you know, all of our news coverage and whatnot, pushing past, getting to the other side of things, do you see a, a specific Chinese company kind of coming out stronger on top once we get through all of this? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, Alibaba and Tencent are so big and have so many pieces. And I suspect, I think it's plausible that they could end up getting broken up either by their own decision or, or at, at the direction of, of the government. And, that, and, and it's not clear that would be a bad thing at all. And in fact, the the breakup of monopolies there, you know, there's no meaningful data set to look back and say, well, how does that work for an investor? The only one that we really have in modern times is AT&T, which worked out really, really well. And so, so anyhow, Alibaba and Tencent, but, but they also pose challenges because they're, they, they're in regulated spaces. They've got healthcare exposure, the, the FinTech, the lending of Ant Group. I mean, that, you know, that, that business was a, was a heck of a business and incredibly profitable. And that's why it is going to be the biggest IPO ever. But they were doing too much loan origination uh, not to be a bank, uh, a real bank. And so that will hurt the value of that business. Um, and and so for that reason, I think JD.com, I just can, to me, just always seems so simple and they've got some other businesses and a fintech business and a healthcare business, but that core business, it's the one that looks the most like what Amazon.com is. I mean, Alibaba's got a great business and big margins, but in terms of the, and they've got a lot of other parts, but in terms of a built, you know, greenfield from scratch, Amazon copy, it's the JD model. I mean, and, and, and I think that, um, it's the one I, I just, of, of the big ones, it's the one I'm the most comfortable with, just the simple long-term story. For sure. Well, there you go. JD might be the one to keep an eye on looking out into the future. One final question rolling in here, which I think will be a, a good one for us to end on coming from Abel, asking, how do you do your due diligence concerning management uh, before investing in these types of companies, when you are looking at emerging economies, obviously there's a, a total difference as far as what reporting looks like and whatnot. How do you actually get in there and kind of figure out what's going on? Well, our approach is is simple. I mean, we we, we operate a rules based index, and so we own every publicly traded emerging and frontier market internet company as long as it meets you know our, our liquidity and size requirements but so we're not doing that type of research um and um now that's not 100 percent true because we, we do research to make sure that the, the problem in the emerging markets is the databases don't always match the the reality of the company right the stock exchange might be different than where they do business they might be registered in you know, a European country, but they're doing business in Southeast Asia. So you got to really go in to the details. And we did only once that we removed a company from the, the index. And that was a company that, that had the ticker GSX. It's now got the ticker GOTU. And it's an online education company that we just, it, it smelled really bad and looked, uh, there was a lot of things about it that, that bothered me. And unfortunately, the process of removing it took a long time. So we tried to get it out at 140 and then it went to 14 and we got out of it and then it went to two. So we, we avoided some of the damage, but that's the only time we've ever 
removed something because so we have the ability to remove something if it smells wrong or otherwise in our judgment is not we don't want in the index but other than that we own you and and again what i rest my hat on and and what i think in these particular companies where i think investors can get comfort is that they really are getting funded by the world's best professional investors before they come public so long before you get involved the really greedy guys the venture capitalists have been out there and finding these companies on the on the ground and investing in them and and you know it's tiger global which manages you know money for all the blue chip uh, endowments and foundations, or it's Sequoia, or it's Co Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is invested in three of our co companies before they went public. So I think that that level of, of due diligence from the world's best investors before I get there gives me a great deal of comfort. Now, that's not the case for you know state-owned oil companies in Brazil and China, but I think for the internet companies, uh, you're in pretty good shape. For sure. Well, definitely some great thoughts there. That is going to round out our time for Q&A today. For all of you out in the audience, if you missed anything today, there will be a full recap here on YouTube, as well as on our site on Guru Focus. This will be the last value investing live of this year. So thank you, Kevin, for coming out, being our final guest here. For those of you out there, please look forward to next year. We've got some big names coming and uh, potentially we'll be bringing Kevin back in the future if we have some some good new interest interesting topics to hit on there. Outside of that, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on this. Do the usual YouTube things there. We always do appreciate it. Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to answer these questions from our audience. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely.